Uh, greetings, everybody. It's a really fantastic crowd, especially for such a cold and windy night, which is, of course, a testament to our speaker today, my subject of our interview that we're going to have, Eric Kleinenberg. And I have the auspicious honor of introducing you to his house, for I am a guest here uh, of his um, as the director of the Institute for Public Knowledge, where you find yourselves uh, uh, on how many floors? We are all two and, two and five. Um, so for those of you who don't know, the Institute for Public Knowledge, I'm going to read what, my cue card this here. This is great. I'm loving this, by the I way. I know. I should have memorized it, though. It develops topics for consideration and discussion in an effort to bring together academics, social researchers, and organizational leaders around issues of public concern. It is one of the preeminent, really multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary uh, uh, institutions here at NYU that brings together fabulous public intellectuals uh, and is host to many exciting events like this one tonight. My name is Beth Novak. Uh, in addition to being a fellow here at IPK, I am also the director of the Governance Lab at NYU's Tandon School of Engineering. The Governance Lab focuses on the impact of technology on government, on governance, and on democracy. And together, GovLab and Tandon and IPK here on this side of the river are delighted to be co-organizing a series of lectures this year focused on the future of democracy. So I think we can agree that this is a highly timely topic, uh, that we are all deeply, deeply concerned about the future of our public institutions, of our so social life, and of our ability to really tackle the tremendous public challenges that we're facing, both effectively and also legitimately. So I think you and I would probably both agree that whereas there probably isn't some mythical golden age in which politics was perfect and government did everything right, I think we can all agree that today most of us feel that things are going in the wrong direction and that we need to do something about it, which is why we come together for this series not simply to talk about and diagnose the ills and the ailments of our public institutions, but hopefully to focus on what we can do better and what we can do differently. Technology is part of that story, but only part of it. And we're going to hear and hopefully talk tonight about some of the other ways in which we can actually use policy and we can actually use a series of other interventions, uh, very much real world, not just virtual world, to improve the fabric of our demo democratic life and of our social life. So this is, I'm really delighted, and it's only coincidental, I have to say, that Eric is the author of this wonderful new book, Palaces for the People, which fits perfectly within our series. Hold it up for the camera, there we go. Um, and which I would encourage all of you to buy, please, after uh, the talk. And I'm going to commit Eric to sticking around, to signing books, and to uh, uh, autographing them and telling you all the good bits that are in it. Um, and we're going to have such a short time to talk tonight. I've read the book, and I hope you have too. But if you haven't, I can tell you that it is worth reading the whole thing. Because above all, Eric is a beautiful and gorgeous storyteller. This book is just phenomenally written. He really has a deep and transformative command of the literature and of the research on the relationship between place and built environment and community. Uh, and its implications for public health, for well-being, and for democracy. But he renders all of that knowledge, really. He conveys it in such a way that it is really a tremendously lovely read because he tells it in the form of very, very diverse stories that take us to places as diverse as the New York Public Library and the hot springs of Iceland. Um, it is an ethnography of infrastructure that ranges from discussions, again, about pools and about libraries and about parks and schools and campuses and methadone clinics and urban farms and a whole range of enviable places that he's traveled. I cannot believe how many places you got to go to write this book. I'm thoroughly jealous. Uh, it is one of the advantages of working on physical infrastructure instead of virtual. I just sit on my couch and surf on the internet. Um, but he actually gets to go to a lot of places and talk to people to really try to give us a sense of the importance of what we're going to be talking tonight, which is the notion of civic or social infrastructure. And making what I think is a tremendously profound and important argument, one that's been recognized by a lot of great reviews of this book, that our policymakers are getting it wrong 
when they're focusing on punishing people instead of investing in the infrastructures that can ennoble us and that can repair the fabric of our social life and our democratic life. So I'm going to sit down and start by just guiding us through some questions for Eric, but we're going to open it up as quickly as possible to you for this conversation. We are streaming live, we hope. <laughs> in which case, if you are in the audience, we would ask you to please just raise your hand. We have roving mics and to ask your questions out loud. But if you're joining us on the internet, we invite you to tweet questions to hashtag IPK, Institute for Public Knowledge, that's IPK. So tweet your questions and we'll grab them and we'll try to get some uh, questions off the, uh, from the inner tube as well as then from the room. All right. So start us off, just tell us the story of how you got started looking at this question of social or civic infrastructure. What is it and how did you get interested in doing this? So, so I want to do that, but I, I also want to say, first of all, thank you. And this is a completely bizarre experience, actually, because <laughs> normally I have your job. I mean, I'm the one who hosts these things. And so this reminds me of when we had our, our children and uh, we used to love to have dinner parties, but we found that we never had enough like, time or energy to cook big meals for friends. And we had these neighbors who said, like, oh, we have a really good idea. Um, we, you, we can host at your place. And so we would invite people, these, like, one couple would come over for dinner, and then they would make us dinner in our home. And it feels a little bit like that. It's like hosting, <laughs> hosting at my place. It's the, it's the best thing. So I'm, the, I'm completely loving this. And thanks for that. That was a great okay, introduction. Let's do it. I feel like I can retire now and you can just take over and no one would notice the difference. <laughs> so um, let me tell you a little bit about this concept of social infrastructure and how I came to it and what work I think it does and, and, and why I think it's useful. So I know that it's a very strange concept. It's not how we ordinarily think of infrastructure. We might think that infrastructures have a, a, a capacity to shape social life. Like clearly, if you build a good transit system that allows people to be in the social world in a, in a different way or more expansive way. And we know that really well because we're sitting in a city that has failed to maintain a good transit system. And so our social lives are affected by that profoundly, right? There's not a person in this room who doesn't know the problem of hard infrastructure not working well as social infrastructure. But when I talk about social infrastructure, I mean something kind of more specific. I, I define it as the physical places and the organizations that shape our interactions. And when the, the so, so I, I should say I think of social infrastructure as being just as real as the infrastructure for power or for water or for transit. It is a, it's a real tangible thing. And when we invest in it, uh, we make it all the more likely that people will interact in a recurrent way with others who are around them, whether that's you know friends and family even, or neighbors and strangers. And, and, and so I guess, it, you know, one way to think about it, imagine, um, think about a playground. Like th think about a, a, a playground in a neighborhood as a kind of social infrastructure. If you, if you live close to a good playground and you have kids, you're much more likely to go out there with your kids and push them at the same swing set, you know, a couple days a week. And think about for a moment all of the relationships that have started in the world because there's a social infrastructure called a playground there. And if you live near it, you can go there. And there are probably other people who are in some ways in your situation who will also push their kids at that swing set around the same time. And over time, like that, those, those people become more familiar to you. And that connection that starts as a glance turns into something more like a relationship because that infrastructure is there. If you live in a neighborhood where there are no playgrounds and there's no really good place to go and, and run around with your children and you have kids, you're much more likely to just sit inside where you'll be by yourselves. Or maybe you'll have to travel someplace which you, you won't do as much. And if you live in a situation where there's no real investment in producing or maintaining social infrastructures like playgrounds, you're far more likely to be individuated and on your own. So, so that's an example of the kind of thing I mean. And a hard infrastructure can be a social infrastructure. You can design a hard infrastructure so that it promotes social activity, and we can talk about that more. But not, not all hard infrastructures do that. 
So there's very real, you give a very vivid picture in the book of the very real public health consequences, though, of that kind of isolation. So I'm wondering, with the indulgence of your wife, who has probably heard every story in the book 10 times, uh, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about some of the early work, the kind of uh, work that you were doing in Chicago that really got you interested in this. Um, and what's the consequence? Because for a lot of us, we, especially New Yorkers, we crave the chance to be alone. Obviously, you've written, what I forgot to do was give your bio, of course, at the beginning and talk about uh, important work that you've done, like Going Solo and Modern Romance, and you've written some really important books that have talked about being alone, which many of us crave. <laughs> yeah, we're New Yorkers, yeah. <laughs> Right. <laughs> uh, but this has very significant consequences. Right, so, um, you know, so, the, the thing that you should know about me is like, no matter how evangelical I sound at moments, I'm, you know, I'm fundamentally a social scientist. And so my interest is less in kind of like trying to persuade you that you, know, you should do X or Y Z thing as it is to try to understand how things work and to explain social processes that we might not otherwise see. And I first started thinking about this concept of social infrastructure in the very first big research project that I did on my own, which was a, a dissertation that became a book about a heat wave in Chicago in 1995, I grew up in Chicago. It's a city I know very well. Some of you know the story, but it's effectively in, in July of 1995, there was this massive heat wave that hit Chicago. It, the heat lasted just a few days. It was extremely hot. It got about 106 degrees, and with the humidity, it felt more like 126. And hundreds of people, actually more than 700 people died uh, in just a couple of days from this kind of seemingly innocuous event, right, a heat wave. And I was just starting graduate school when it happened and learning to do social science. And one of the things that sociologists love to do is to draw maps, you know, to see where things happen. And so I thought, oh, okay, I'll draw a map of the heat deaths in Chicago and other people were doing the same thing. And it turns out like when you draw a map of who died and where they died in Chicago during the heat wave, you get the most obvious and predictable pattern in the social sciences, which is like the very poor, and very segregated and very vulnerable neighborhoods suffered the most. And you know like every year they award Nobel Prizes in the fall and we all like tune in to see like who's gonna win the Nobel Prize for each scientist. No one will ever win a Nobel Prize for the maps that I made, you know, from the Chicago heat wave. It's just, it's scientifically the most uninteresting thing that could happen. It's like politically really important and it's, and it's politically really puzzling for all of us, I think, to, especially when we live through something like Maria or Sandy or, or uh, Harvey, you know, why is it that we know these events are coming and we know which people and which places are vulnerable and we don't do anything? That's a really interesting political question, but the, but the scientific fact of the patterns of vulnerability is not interesting at all. But I actually decided to push a little deeper and to, to look more closely, and it turns out when you look more closely, some really surprising patterns did emerge. So for instance, there was a bunch of neighborhoods in Chicago that look on paper demographically like they should have really high death rates and did. But there are also a bunch of neighborhoods in Chicago that look like they should have high death rates demographically. In many cases, they had exactly the same demographics as the high impact neighborhoods. But these places turned out to be the most resilient places in Chicago. They had the lowest death rates. And in many cases, they were separated by one street. So like imagine, just like look at this room for a second, imagine we have this division. So we've got the, these two sides and you're basically the same people, right? There's not like culturally, there's not a big difference between you or all the kinds of weird people who come out to like NYU lectures, you know, on a, on a perfectly nice, um, you know, Monday night. And, um, you know, the level of poverty is the same, the age structure is the same, the racial segregation is the same. And on one side of the room over here, massive fatalities. And on this side of the room, 10 times lower. This is like one of the safest places you could possibly be in all the city. So why is that? So I started spending time in these pairs of neighborhoods and what I learned is that the neighborhoods in Chicago that did really well, sorry, I'll start this way. The neighborhoods that didn't do very well were places that had this kind of ecology that felt depleted. So a lot of uh, abandoned houses, a lot of empty lots, the sidewalks were often kind of broken down, not, not maintained well. L little park pocket parks that existed. Do you, do you know like that sometimes you see like a pocket park and it's got weeds and debris and it's 
It's more treacherous than just a concrete slab would be because it, so it's not just the presence of the park, it's that it's not maintained very well. Very few commercial outlets like diners and coffee shops, uh, community organizations, places that draw people out into the world and into public life. And it means like, you know, you guys sat on the wrong side of the room. I'm sorry about this tonight. But like if, if, you, if, you, if you're on this side of the room, if you live in a neighborhood like this, y y you're more likely to just kind of hunker down in your home and you're less likely to get to know the people around you, the people, your neighbors. And so if there's something like a heat wave that's come to town, you guys, you, no matter how much you care about the, you know, the public good in your area, you don't necessarily know who's who, who lives where, and whose door to knock on, right? Because you don't necessarily know who's not around. But on this side of the room, I don't want to forget about you guys, here you've got like the same demographics, but very little de population depletion, right? So there's no abandoned lots, there's no uh, empty buildings, the sidewalks are better maintained, there's a commercial infrastructure, uh, places like neighborhood libraries and, and community organizations and religious institutions that draw people out, so you're just much more likely to get to know the people around you, and that means on a day when a heat wave hits, either you go outside because you feel like I should, I should get out into some public area and be around other people, maybe get help if you need it, or if you stay home, people know that you've stayed home and know to knock on your door. And so places like this, not only, it, it turns out not only were they significantly more likely to survive the heat wave, but there are pairs of neighborhoods I looked at, like one pair of neighborhoods called Englewood and Auburn Gresham that are like this. The life expectancy in the neighborhood that was more intact ecologically was five years longer all the time. It's not just about the heat wave. And I came to think of the differences between those two neighborhoods as being the differences of social, social infrastructure. It's what you have over here and what you don't have over here. And it's, and it's not a luxury to have social infrastructure. I think what I'm trying to argue, it's, it, it can be the difference between life and death. So tell us a little bit more, if you would, about given that this can be the difference between life and death, what characterizes, you've mentioned a number of factors about being sort of tidy versus messy and uh, coffee shops and whatnot. Can you describe across these myriad sort of environments that you looked at, can you generalize in some way what characterizes, what are the sort of physical or environmental characteristics? You tell one story in the book about the transformation in New York City, in some cases from very large schools, high schools, to them breaking them up into smaller sort of mini schools that would suggest that there's something about intimacy or size, but I'm wondering what are the kind of factors that cut across all of these environments from swimming pools to libraries that you would say um, really define the characteristics of a healthy social infrastructure? Yeah, so, so I'm not sure that you can outline the elementary forms of social infrastructure, you know, as sociologists are wont to do. It's, it's very hard to say, here are the kinds of conditions that you need to have and that would hold across cultures because one of the things you find when you travel around the world and look at gathering places is that they vary tremendously, right? And, and places that are very inviting and open in some cultures, some places are, are less so in others. So there are a variety of social infrastructures out there and we can talk about that. But what I am principally interested in are gathering places that are open and accessible, democratic, uh, places where um, people feel a capacity to participate um, and feel uh, welcome. The places, it's important, I talk about maintenance because oftentimes in these conversations about infrastructure we think about the initial phase of you know, development and building and too often we, we neglect to think about what it means to maintain something. I think about this a lot as someone who, grew, I grew up in the city of Chicago uh, at a time when the, 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 the massive public housing projects that were built in the city with gr great enthusiasm and a lot of federal money had really fallen apart and had become sites of, of um, disrepair and, and grotesque violence and segregation. Some people said that was about the architecture of the buildings themselves. And there's a chapter in the book where I write about crime and I try to explain that in, in fact, you know, the, the places in cities like Chicago and St. Louis that proved to be very dangerous proved to be quite <laughs> safe uh, in other parts of the world, including in New York City. It's not so much the, the fact that there are certain high rises that can be dangerous as if you build high rises and you don't maintain them, if you don't have a janitorial staff, if you don't have doormen, uh, it, you know, if you don't have some balance between 
uh, private spaces and public spaces, uh, you can very quickly lose control. And so the, ma the maintenance matters. Um, the distinction that I make in the book that I've been thinking about a lot is the distinction between social infrastructures that are publicly accessible and social infrastructures that are uh, private institutions and that can determine you know, who gets in and who doesn't get in on the basis of one's capacity to pay or on the basis of the, of the manager's whim. And, and I, I say this cautiously because, again, like as someone who grew up in Chicago, I know that if you're trying to describe the vital social infrastructures in the city's many African-American neighborhoods and you didn't highlight the role of barber shops and salons, you would really be missing something. And that, those things are part of the private market. And I was just in England talking about the book. And if you don't talk about the pub in England, you know, you're missing a vital social infrastructure, right? So it's not that private sector places aren't part of the social infrastructure, but they don't get emphasized in my book as much as the public places that we can manage and control. And they also don't get emphasized because there's an ex incredible kind of arbitrary factor when it comes to regulating private infrastructure, and that is that they're regulated by the proprietors. In many cases, uh, a, a, a private social infrastructure like a restaurant or a cafe signals to people who's wanted and who isn't wanted through style or through the prices of things on the menu, right? So I spent a lot of time doing research for this book in the Lower East Side in an area around Seward Park, which maybe some of you know. And Seward Park is one of these very gentrifying neighborhoods. It's still, you know, it's the Lower East Side. It's still got thick concentrations of immigrants <coughs> and very poor people. But it is also a place that's gentrifying very quickly. And, you know, if you've spent time down there, you know, like, if you're the kind of person who wakes up on a Saturday morning and you're thinking to yourself, like, where can I go and spend $9 on an ice cream cone? You know? <laughs> which, where, which, where the only flavor is salt. You know, if, you, if, if that's like, if that's what you're interested in, you can find so many places like that on the Lower East Side. Or if you think like, I'd really like to get a $7 cup of coffee at a place that doesn't accept cash because they're credit card only, you know? They're all over Seward Park, right? And like those are places they are, for the newcomers in Seward Park, those are awesome social infrastructures, but they, but they are, work a little bit differently. And of course, like you guys all remember what happened in Philadelphia last summer with Starbucks, right? You know that story of the, not everyone. Else. So the two African American guys go into Philadelphia Starbucks last summer. Tell me if this guy have ever happened to you. You go to meet some friends, and they're late. <laughs> Has that happened to you guys ever? <laughs> you go and you. So these guys are in a Starbucks. Their friend is late, and after ten minutes, does the manager say, "Excuse me, gentlemen. We've noticed that you've been sitting here for a while, uh, and this is an establishment where we ask people to buy something." <laughs> No, he does not do that. Do they say, we're sorry, gentlemen, we notice you've been sitting here for a while, and um, this is a place you have to pay for something, and so we're going to ask you to leave. That, that sounds obnoxious, but that would have been very kind compared to what they did do, which is call the police and have them arrested. And it was one of those moments where they're like, a lot of people in the United States were thinking like, oh my God, can you believe it? People are getting arrested for sitting in Starbucks. And then a lot of other people are like, of course that's what happens, because so much of our commercial private space is exclusive. And if you show up there and you don't have the skin color or the class status or the age that they want you to have, they will kick you out or do or worse, they will arrest you. That happened, by the way, in a McDonald's in Queens three years ago. A group of elderly Koreans were forced out and they called the police because they stayed too long. They actually paid for things. So some social infrastructures can be private, but I'm really much more interested in, in those physical places where everyone is welcome. And the reason that so much of the book is about the library and they call it Palaces for the People is that in the course of my research, I realized that there, there are very few places that are as open and as accessible and programmed to be welcoming as libraries. So since you're mentioning the library, I have 10 things I want to ask you, but let's take that last one. Um, so much of the discussion here and so much, I mean, the whole title of Palaces for the People that gives it its title um, is so much of the story is about the way in which, for example, libraries treat people with dignity. And that seems to be a very, very important part of the story. Um, and, there's, and it's juxtaposed against the other thing that you're mentioning, which is a very deep backstory to this, which is about race 
and which is about discrimination. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about both of those strands in some way is that the story about race and discrimination, which seems to have led to policies that are highly punitive and much less focused on building these positive social conditions on the one hand, and the, uh, and the opposite story, which is the one about treating people with dignity. So I think I, I, I both want you to talk about libraries, but I also want you to tell us more about how race informs this work, which it does very deeply. Well, let's, let's start with the library part, and in part because this is, it's, a, it's a very weird thing, this book. And like, the book came out in September, and I think like, the second week the book was out, the Kavanaugh hearing started. You guys remember the whole Kavanaugh thing? Remember that? <laughs> and it's like, forget, so, and, it, and it was a, it's a, been a weird time to publish this book, I have to say, because it's a book that has a, an argument about how to rebuild you know, our society and makes the claim that there are actually a bunch of things that we could do that are kind of within our capacity that aren't even all that expensive or difficult that would make the world a much better place. It turns out this is a very weird time to be making any kind of positive argument about how to build something that's good because most of us are used to kind of getting, sitting around and like talking about the situation, you know? Like we, I don't know if maybe I'm just crazy, you're all looking at me like maybe I'm a little crazy. Are you like this? Like, there's a huge amount of time that we all spend every day, like going on Twitter, updating the New York Times, finding out what completely insane thing just happened in the last three hours that's even more insane than the thing that happened yesterday that we thought was the most insane and crazy and ludicrous thing that could ever happen, right? And so, so I, I'm kind of tempted to start with the race thing, but I also feel like part of the, part of the idea of the book is to get us to think more about the library kind of thing. And so I'm going to start the, with libraries. And the, I asked you both at the same, because I don't know where to start either. Is it positive or the negative? Well, they go to, I mean, they, 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 they are better. definitely of, of a piece. But um, to the extent that the book is an argument for us to be thinking about the things that we can build differently um, and not you know, how to unbuild things, I think it's important to focus on. So like the libraries, the way I started thinking about the library is that many of you know that um, the Institute for Public Knowledge, where you're sitting, really kind of grew and developed um, right after Sandy. I became the director here in September of 2012, announced that we were going to do a lot of work on cities and climate change, and then in October 2012, Sandy hit. And we became a really big um, part of the citywide conversation and the national conversation about what does climate change mean for cities and how do you rebuild for 21st century challenges. Um, we started all these research groups, many of them graduate student run. We did a lot of writing, you know, magazine articles, social science reports. Um, and then uh, I got a call in early 2013 asking if, if I would be the research director for this Rebuild by Design competition, which would ultimately be housed at IPK on this floor. And the competition was like the federal government. Do you guys remember the Obama administration? The, the, <laughs> the age of, remember the age of reason? Um, and so, so like, the idea was that they were going to invest in a, in a design competition to generate ideas for how to help cities brace for the 21st century. And uh, so my job was to show these design teams of engineers and architects and landscape architects around the city and, and kind of show them different needs and vulnerabilities and possibilities. Actually, we were looking at three different states, New York, New Jersey, and uh, Connecticut. And I was really pushing this idea of social infrastructure on the teams because I knew that we, we couldn't respond to climate change the way we responded to 9-11, which is to kind of create an infrastructure that's like hard security that may or may not protect people, but that certainly makes life feel more fortified and militarized and inefficient. Like if you think about the bollards and the barriers and the security checkpoints and the cameras and all the times you have to give your ID to some random person who goes does God knows what with it. Like, we, if we try to do that with climate change, it's not going to work, you know, and, and we're going to have a really kind of ugly city. And the context of this is like, you, you, I don't know if you remember this, but right after Sandy hit, the big idea that engineers and a lot of policy officials had for how to protect New York City from a climate event was, tell me, tell me if you recognize this phrase, the idea was build a wall. Does that sound familiar? And that was literally the idea, like, let's build a wall around New York. So I was, I was trying to say to these teams, like, there's a better way to do this than building walls. 
and all your plans for climate security should have social infrastructure baked into them. So I was with this one design team one day and we were walking around a neighborhood and they said, Eric, we finally understand this social infrastructure idea and we've come up with a prototype for a new kind of building that we think is um, gonna be able to do all the things you want. It's gonna make communities safer and we're calling this building a resilience center. And I said, that sounds awesome. You know, who doesn't want a resilience center? Can you tell me what you mean? And they said, yeah, like, th what we're thinking of is a, is a building, like a new prototype. We're gonna have this in this neighborhood. Imagine like a, a building that's kind of generously sized and it's gonna be open a lot of it, like as much of the time as possible because we want it to be a second home for people who live in the neighborhood. So open six days a week at least. And it's gonna be staffed by people who are like aggressively welcoming. You know, their, their job is going to make sure that everybody feels like they really belong. And we know that um, people who are most at risk for, um, you know, dying in a disaster or for you know, being left behind during a crisis are really young people and old people. So we're going to have a lot of programs specifically designed to make them feel at home. Like, so, you know, we'll have like story time and sing-alongs and arts programs for little kids. And we know that little kids are gonna come with caretakers. They don't just gonna come to the resilience center by themselves. And so, um, you know, like we'll have like free Wi-Fi access and computers and things like that for their caretakers so they have stuff to do. And for older people we'll have, like we'll have reading groups, you know, book clubs, and we'll, we'll also do maybe craft things and probably some creative programming, current events, conversations. And we're really excited about this idea. What do you think? And I, my response was like, wow, that sounds amazing. And I also said, have you ever been to a library? <laughs> Be because it, it very much seemed to me like they had just reinvented the library, you know? And, 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 I get, and at first I was frustrated and then I thought like, oh, actually we live in this moment where what the world tells us, like the ethos of our time is that there's new problems that no other generation has ever like experienced before. And the solution to this problem is new, some new technology, right? It could probably involves an app or it could involve some like new materials. And um, the market has probably got to be a really big part of it. It's gonna be driven by the marketplace. And so no one would think that there are actually these things, like you talked about high tech and kind of in the beginning of your presentation though, in the opening, like this is a very low tech solution in some ways, the library to an old problem. And it occurred to me that like we have collectively failed to recognize the capacity that we have in these institutions that are actually in every single neighborhood in this and almost every city you can think of, and in most suburbs and small towns as well. And so, I, so the way I got to the library is it occurred to me the kind of institution that in a way represents social infrastructure at its best is both a place that we walk by every day, like think about how close you all are to libraries, and also a place that we take for granted and neglect and don't invest in, and so don't get enough out of. And oh, I realized I had to like, make the spine of this book, the library, and that, that's the, the Palaces for the People t title comes from Andrew Carnegie's concept. And you know, Andrew Carnegie, like, when it comes to human decency, has a very mixed record, um, <laughs> right? I mean, he was, like the Bill Gates of his time and had, was like a notorious strike breaker and called in the Pinkertons to you know, hurt his workers and, and did a lot of bad things, but also it needs to be said, gave away the equivalent of $250 billion in real money and helped to build 2,800 libraries around the world, including more than 1,700 in the US. And now we have these, we've, we've inherited these libraries that are really improbable and, and they could be doing more, but they also exemplify something that I think is in short order uh, in the society we live in today, and that is a place that is accessible uh, and welcoming and programmed and generous, and then to go back to your phrase, that dignifies everyone who comes into it, right? So I spent a, like a year going to libraries pretty much every day, and I can tell you it's like libraries, beca because there's so many holes in our safety net, Libraries are taking in people who are falling through the cracks all over the place. So homeless people, people with mental illness, people with substance abuse, war veterans, people who've just come out of uh, incarceration, very old people, very young people, very poor people who want internet access. They're all coming into these very, what are in some cases very tight quarters. And in the year that I spent going to libraries just about every day, I can count on one hand the number of times that 
people acted out so much that the police had to be called in because there was a security problem. And that's a really stunning thing. Like, and, and I think it's partly because libraries as places somehow bring out not necessarily the best of people every day, but something that's really good in us because they do dignify people by recognizing their humanity. That was such a long-winded answer. I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> Sorry. The, uh, uh, that's what we're, we're here, well, that's what we're here for. It seems only long-winded to you. So apropos of places that are welcoming versus exclusionary, we're sitting here more or less, less or more by our standards on a college campus. And universities are another potential space uh, for diverse people to mix, for community to be created, to create, to really uh, have those physical affordances that help to build social capital and learning and whatnot. And yet it seems a very mixed bag when it comes to universities. I don't know if you want to talk about our own or about more generally. Um, but what your take is on the college campus. And there surely is you know, a story to be told, and you do tell some of it in the book about how, when it comes to the accessibility of education, obviously new technology and the internet are making education much more widely accessible uh, in a way that campuses often do not. Uh, this university, among others, is a very expensive place to go. So I'm wondering whether, you know, as whether in your pantheon of social infrastructure, where the campus falls and universities fall for you. Well, I think universities are, are central, actually. I think that in some ways they, they have become a kind of modern agora. Uh, there are, you know, tens of millions of Americans uh, spend some time in universities. A stunning number of people will spend at least a year of their life on a university campus, and, and, and many will spend more of that. Um, I, I work in a uni university. I'm an advocate and champion of universities. I think universities have a tremendous amount to offer, and if we're going to get back into the age of reason, it's only going to be because the universities collectively find a way to help lead the way. That said, again, as someone who grew up in Chicago and who now works in New York, um, I know all about the ways in which universities can be exclusive. Um, you know, the University of Chicago was historically one of the great forces for the segregation of the South Side, and it now maintains the largest private police force in the United States. Um, the University of Chicago, like Columbia University, uh, and many universities does a very clear job of uh, establishing for the city, you know, who is welcome here and who is not welcome here. Now, I write in the book about the fact that the University of Chicago itself has changed quite a lot and has tried to build bridges. They have a guy named Theaster Gates who's on the art faculty there who's built a whole set of bridges physically to build, to bring the university uh, more in touch with people in the neighborhoods around it and to, and to try to create relationships that didn't exist before. We all know that Columbia has tried very hard to do that. NYU is obviously a controversial player in this neighborhood because, you know, for some people it's an institution that brings diversity and cultural richness to a, what might otherwise be, uh, you know, just a fantasy land for capital. What's the alternative? NYU is not here. You know, what gets developed in this, in this area? But at the same time, NYU is impossibly expensive and exclusive and locked down for most people much of the time. Now, I'm not trying to be self-promoting of the Institute for Public Knowledge, but you know, what we, ha we are trying to create in the space that you're sitting is an Institute for Public Knowledge, and we take it as our mission here to not only create knowledge that is publicly useful and accessible and engaging, but to create forums where people who wouldn't ordinarily come to spend a night at the university could have this kind of event. So could I just ask could, uh, for a show of hands, can you please raise your hand if you are not currently a student or employee of NYU? Wow. So like when I see all those hands, I feel good about the mission that, you know, that, we, are, that we have here. Like we're, I think like that, that's a good thing for IPK. Now, as a university in general, is NYU living up to that? Are we doing that all the time? No, I think like we're an exception it's important that we have resources to do it and the university gives it to us. Um, but unfortunately, the model for most American universities has been to, to lock people out. And I think that's uh, a great source of frustration. And one of the big issues that I think, you know, we're gonna be dealing with collectively, and my wife just finished a book about this, is like, how do you make college and university more accessible to more people? 
Um, how do you make it so students can come to university and not find themselves indebted for the rest of their lives and so that their families will not bear the weight of, of that debt for the rest of their lives and that's, that's you know, her territory. But how is it that universities can create shared spaces where the, the show of hands that we just got here would feel like a very ordinary thing because universities belong to everyone? But there's, I just want to push you on this a little bit more because there are spaces, one could say, look, there are places like this one, for example, which foster community, have a sense of mission and purpose that brings people in, uh, take things like fraternities or sororities or other kinds of um, uh, <coughs> student groups where on the one hand they create a sense of cohesion and belonging among their members which give people a sense of rootedness and create very meaningful social experiences of the kind that you promote in the book and on the other hand are extraordinarily exclusive and exclusionary and often in the case of fraternities, uh, also you know sometimes violent and uh, uh, exhibit yeah. sociopathic yeah. behavior. So where yeah. is the line so between I these different kinds of strong community or exclusionary? So I, I take this up directly in the book, and thank you for you know pushing on it. So let's be clear that I think there there are grounds for exclusionary communities in some cases. So there is a concept of the counter public that social scientists will often use to think about the gathering places for uh, minority or uh, oppressed groups who uh, need a safe space to, to convene and to uh, kind of work out ideas um, before engaging a broader public that is set up to uh, dominate them. So for instance, like the, I've mentioned the black barbershop and the salon, those are, in the literature on counter publics, those are classic counter spaces, which are safe spaces, where you'd say, you know, like, there are black, part, like Melissa Harris, and her first book was about, you know, barbershops, in part, and, and BET television, and she did an ethno ethnography, she actually hired an African-American graduate student to do an ethnography of an all-male barbershop on the south side of Chicago, and she had to hire this man because they didn't allow women in there. You know, and they didn't allow white men in there either. Do I have a deep fundamental problem with that black barbershop on the south side of Chicago compared to an all-white exclusive fraternity at the University of Mississippi or at NYU? I, I don't. I, I, I'm willing to accept that I think that's part of a counter public and plays a special role. If I have an institution, however, that is an exclusionary uh, social space and that then has a track record over time of being, of promoting violence, of incubating violence, right? Of being, uh, you know, discriminatory uh, and, and having a, a, a profoundly negative impact. Then my 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 views of it start to shift. And so, in the book, I take issue with the ongoing support that fraternities get from university campus, from you know, from university administrators. You know, you know, fraternities serve a very special role in American university life because they solved for growing universities, the problem of having to build new housing. You know, fraternities actually created a lot of housing for universities that didn't want to invest in it in them. And they also created profound social bonds that in many cases deepened students' satisfaction with the university experience and commitment to the university over time, such that if you join a fraternity, you're more likely to make financial contributions to the university over time because it's, right, because it's an important thing for you. So universities are now deeply invested in these institutions, but we now know, we have a great amount of data on the fact that like fraternities, not all of them, but many of them, uh, foster dangerous drinking, you know, not just social drinking, but dangerous binge drinking. In many cases, you know, physical abuse of the members of fraternity and in far too many cases, sexual violence. And if they, since they seem unable to stop that, it seems to me like they should no longer be supported. And it's time for universities to step up and do something about that. So that's a very different kind of exclusionary social space, and I, I have strong feelings about it. So I would be remiss now if I didn't uh, push you uh, as, you know, I come from the other side of the river from the engineering school where we have a lot of people who think about virtual affordances, who think about the design of virtual spaces, who will tell you about the importance in terms of social capital building of sites like Patients Like Me, where people can 
build community among disease sufferers. You write yourself about the ways in which the internet enables people to find a spouse or to engage in political protest. Um, there obviously are uh, tools like, or, or uh, uh, sites like uh, Crisis Text Line, yeah. which are tremendously life-saving for people. Yeah. So how can you talk about social affordances and social infrastructure and not talk about the, vir the role of the internet and the virtual spaces? You, you can't. You, you need to talk about the role of the internet. And, and where, you say, are, and where so are those yeah, spaces? Because so it ain't Facebook. No, right, that's right. So, <laughs> it, you know, so look, I had, unfortunately, several friends get very sick with cancer this past year. And all of them set up CaringBridge sites. Do you guys know about CaringBridge? I hope you never have to deal with CaringBridge. Um, but if you have someone who's sick in your life and they require care and attention from a big community of people all over the world, it does amazing things that like none of us could do before. So you can post your story, you can have a person maintain the site for you, you can organize meals, you can um, send notes that give progress reports, you can build a virtual community that would be impossible without this technology. It's like, it, it's, it's an amazing thing. You know that the internet can do, and um, next door is another kind of cool website out there where, like, you live in a neighborhood. It's not used so much in New York City, but like we went on sabbatical and lived in a suburb in California for a year, and everybody was using next door, and you could use it to find uh, daycare and learn about schools and you know get all kinds of local information. So there, I think there are terrific websites out there, and I wrote a whole book about internet dating, you know, which has its downsides. Trust me. Um, but is also connect, helping to connect a lot of people. So it's, it's not like I'm against the internet, but I don't think that the social media are really social infrastructure. And, and, and I especially got frustrated when, after the 2016 election, Mark Zuckerberg wrote this letter to maybe you guys, are you guys in Mark Zuckerberg's network? He has like two billion, maybe three billion people in the network now. So he wrote this um, post you know, to all Facebook users and the post was, you know, this is a really tough election, and I know there are a lot of people who feel, feel really concerned about the future of the world. And, you know, it used to be that people had these things like town halls and churches and civic groups, you know, that they went to. And we know that all those things are in decline, but good news, everybody. Um, we have Facebook now. We have a new, and, and what he said is, Facebook is, is your social infrastructure. He used that concept, and he said, um, uh, um, like this is going to be the place where you can come for meaningful interaction, right? Do you remember that phrase? Like Facebook's going to be able to meet. You're going to have meaningful community, meaningful interaction on Facebook. And the, I got very upset about that because I, we just spent a year like around Stanford and, and Menlo Park, which is the mothership for Facebook. And I first of all got upset just because like when anyone tells you that there's a big social problem and their product is the solution to this problem, you should be very, very skeptical of that claim, right? Unless it's an author trying to sell their book, which is a completely, <laughs> totally, different, uh, totally different thing, and usually that's right. But, um, but what was really offensive to me about this idea is like, we'd spent time on the Facebook campus. I'm sure you've been to the Facebook campus. Anyone else here been to the Facebook campus? The Facebook campus is Shangri-La. Like, Mark, there's nobody on earth who spent more money on physical social infrastructure than Mark Zuckerberg, right? Like, it's maybe Larry and Sergey and the Apple guys and Jeff Bezos, but like, the tech guys who tell us use social media, they have built these amazing, amazing campuses where there's like bike paths and walking paths and all, like hallways designed for serendipitous, serendipitous encounters and like, lunch was with free, like they throw kale at you when you walk in and <laughs> you like, when you're coding, people a, come around and tiki, massage you. tiki bar on yeah. the roof. I mean, it's like, it's so, you can't believe, it. and the reason that they build these incredible lush physical infrastructures, social infrastructures, is because they are all in the business of trying to attract talent and then keep them. If you hire someone at Facebook or at Google or at Apple or Amazon, your challenge is you don't want them to leave and go to your competitor. And how do you make them stay? Do you give them an awesome phone and say, here, use Facebook? No, you create an amazing social infrastructure. And so they're all hiring the world's best architects and landscape architects and designers to build awesome places. And then they, and so for Zuckerberg to tell us, like social, you know, your social infrastructure is gonna be Facebook, 
I think that's disingenuous or worse. And so I think like the, the, all of these internet that things, like CaringBridge, I guess is a little in different because just being in touch with people online and being able to write to people is helpful. But really CaringBridge helps because it gets you to the place where you can be with the person who's in your life who's sick and you can help them. And Nextdoor is helpful l largely because it helps you get to a physical person who you can be with. And like dating apps suck if all you do is stay on the app. Like a dating app works better if you go on an actual date, right? So, so, um, so that, that's my thing about the, the internet. It's like it, it, it works, but there has to be that, if you don't invest in the physical place, if you don't have the physical place where you can have an in real life interaction, it's gonna wind up being empty. Okay, but physical places and spaces are expensive, right? It contributes to the cost of this university is that we have these big, beautiful buildings sitting on fancy real estate. So the question is sort of trade-offs here. It's all well and good to say, and this is where I wanna get to the prescriptive part, the policy part, um, to policymakers that they need to make these investments. But how would you, what are those investments and how do you justify, what are we trading off then? What are we not doing in order to pay for more libraries, in order to pay for more bowling leagues? So in, in, my, in my world, we're not giving like $1.5 trillion tax cuts to the wealthiest people in this country. I mean, I think, and, and it's, a really, it's a really big issue now because you know, we've just given this massive gift to the wealthiest people in the country. And I don't think that's gonna last for very long. It's gonna be hard to turn it around, but we, you know, we've done something that's unsustainable. And it's interesting how, like we're so tough on each other about how to pay for things. And I feel like when they take over government, like they're not asking like, how are we gonna pay for this? They just cut it, you know? And so I, I think we should have the serious conversation and I want to, but I, I think there are more things that are possible for us than we But the, but the more nuanced question, just to ask it differently, is right, we also need to fix our bridges. We need to fix our tunnels. We need to fix our, we have, we have physical infrastructure of a more traditional kind that's also falling apart. Yes, and I want those things fixed. And we, and we are going to spend, like I take the subway as much as you guys do. When the L-line was gonna close down, that was gonna <laughs> completely screw my life. So I'm, you know, like I, I want the right investments in infrastructure, we all do. And the hard infrastructure can be social infrastructure. So th there's two ways I wanna take this. First of all, it's just inevitable. Like in the coming years, we are going to spend it's first gonna be tens of billions and it will be trillions of dollars. Like if you look at any estimate of the amount of money that's gonna get spent on infrastructure in this country and around the world that we're talking trillions of dollars in our lifetime because the systems that we have to keep us in the modern world just don't work anymore, right? And we all know, like we know that more than anybody, right? Because we are New Yorkers and we've been living under, you know, inside of it. And that's actually really important because how many of you take the subway? Will you raise your hand if you take the subway? When the subway works well, you know like when you, when you like go down and the subway's there, it's like you're flying through the city, you know, it's this kind of amazing experience. You're like high-fiving everybody as you walk out. It's like, this, it's like an amazing, like when the subway works well in New York City, it's the best feeling, you know? And, and the feeling it gives you is like, I live in an amazing place. I love my city. It's really good to live here, you know? A everybody has, jumped on the L train and like found themselves in Williamsburg, drinking a $9 cup of coffee 10 minutes later and think this is an amazing world I live in, right? Like who, who on earth has not had that experience, right? So, but, but when the subway is not working well, when we don't invest in the subway, when we let it fall apart and you go down there and you go to the six train and it's five o'clock and there's 37,000 people like on the platform and you have to wait to get to the stairs to go down to the subway, right? Like, we, and we've all had that experience too and then you finally get on the subway and it stops, you know? <laughs> then you like, you hate everybody, you're, you're, you're mean to your wife when you get home, like er, you know, just everything is bad and the, you, and the city's bad and the government's bad. So like we have to take care of our infrastructure. There's no doubt about that. But if we're going to build infrastructure, there's different, there's different ways you can do it. And, and I, so for instance, hard infrastructure can be more or less social. So let's t go back to the rebuild by design competition. One of the big things we push for on climate security is like, if you want to protect the Lower East Side from inundation in the next storm, you could build a wall or you can do what the design team that wound up winning one of the awards from rebuild by design proposed, which is you can build what they call the bridging berm. That was like a sloped parkland that over time, like 
functioned like a wall because it sloped up over hundreds of yards. But on that hundreds of yards between the river uh, and, the, and the edge was a, a bike path, a walking path, trees, plants, athletic fields, green area. Now, some of you know what's happened to that proposal and how it's gotten messed up, and we can talk about that too. But the idea here is like a wall, you know, a, a water protection system, a flood protection system can be a simple wall. A levee can be a simple wall, or you can make a wall that explodes the concept of a wall and creates all kinds of these things you call social affordances, right? And you can go down the line with different kinds of infrastructures. And if you have the concept of social infrastructure in your vocabulary, if that, that you have a whole new menu of possibilities for developing things. So, so one thing to keep in mind that's most basic is when we're building hard infrastructure, bridges and the like, if we think about how they operate as social infrastructure, climate security, think about how much money we're gonna spend on climate security in coming years. We build really differently. And when it comes to libraries, I think in part it's a, it's a problem of failing to appreciate a thing that is right in front of us that is actually not that expensive to invest in, right? It, like, a, an amazing branch library does so many things, right? Including during crisis. Like, why doesn't every branch library in New York City have a generator so that it can be a place where people can go when there's an emergency? Now, generators aren't great for the environment, but you don't use them all that often. But libraries have been important staging grounds for emergency responses in crisis after crisis around the world. They should have that capacity, right? Why is it like, here's another big issue that for libraries, and this is social infrastructure too, it's about the programming of them. Have you guys heard that 60 years ago, the subway ran faster than it runs today? Do you know that? The, the subway is now slower than it was. Well, say it again. It's too noisy. But it's, it's, it was faster before than it is now. That's a crazy thing. So 60 years ago, the libraries, <laughs> were open more often and in better condition than they are today. Like the other day, well, I won't tell this whole story, but like the libraries are based, the they're, book, closed on, the they're closed on, say it again? I said buy the book. Buy the book. The um, library, th so Sundays used to be the most popular day of the week for libraries in New York right. City. Why were Sundays the most popular day? Because most, you know, it's a day when a lot of people are not working. And it's a day when people who aren't working have time to be with their family, to be with their neighbors, to read, to be together. Libraries were built to do that, right? They were used to be used all the time. They're not used that way anymore because they're closed on Sunday. I found out the hard way when I tried to take my daughter there, you know, and found that the doors were locked. Libraries used to be open till late at night. They are now closed at six o'clock or at seven o'clock or at eight o'clock if you're really lucky, which means if you have a nine to five job, or in this city, like an eight to six job, you know, you, you, you can't really use the library when you come home. And just having the places that we've invested in be open would be an amazing thing. Like, maybe I, I, I should start with this, but I, I wanna say, make this point about libraries. If the library did not exist today, like imagine if there was no such thing as a library, it didn't, it was not a thing. And I talked about all these ideas and I called it a library and we all got really excited about it. And we're like, okay, what we wanna do today is at the end of this lecture, we're gonna march down to City Hall and maybe we'll go to the White House and we're gonna say like, okay, Mayor de Blasio, progressive, or <coughs> you know, Donald Trump, whatever we wanna call you. Um, we've come up with this amazing idea for a thing called the library. And what we want you to do, we, wanna, we want the government to help build and maintain a building in every neighborhood, in every city in the country, and in suburbs, and in small towns, and we wanna fill it up with books, and with periodicals, and with videos, and computers, and we're gonna staff it with these magical people we call librarians, whose job is to say like, how can I help you, and not to judge you, and uh, we're gonna make sure that everybody is welcome, like any social class, any <coughs> ethnic group, any race, any language, any age, even if you're not a citizen, you know what, if you're not a citizen, you're especially welcome here. We really want you here. And, w and not only are you welcome here, all that stuff that we have, we're gonna lend it to you for free. And we're gonna do that because you're a human being. And because as a human being, you deserve access to our shared cultural heritage. If we, imagine that we, if the library didn't exist and we went to City Hall and asked that of Mayor de Blasio, 
he would tell us to fuck off. <laughs> and, 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 and Donald Trump would say something worse, right? Because that, that is the, cra like if you think about that idea, that is the craziest idea in the history of ideas, that, that, that we're gonna have that. And the truth is that we are unbelievably lucky because we have inherited by accident a world that was partially built by people who had a concept of the public good. And a world of people who are willing to give up some of their hard-earned dollars to the state to build publicly good things. And those publicly good things were like subways, and they were parks, and they were bridges. There were all these things, but they were also libraries. And because, because we are lucky enough to have inherited all that stuff, we live in a world where we can still use those. But can you imagine that we, like the, in the spirit of our time right now, that we have the political will and collective capacity to create things like that and to maintain things like that and to give it to the generation who's, that's coming next? And that is really something to reckon with. I'm gonna ask you two 30 second questions. I mean, the question will be three seconds. The answer seconds. has yeah. to be 30 yeah. seconds. And then I wanna, uh, so fair warning to everybody that we're now gonna turn it over to you. And again, if you are online, hashtag IPK. So you may have answered this already, but I noticed that the review of your book in the Times was done by now presidential candidate Pete of the unpronounceable last can't name. Say his last name, can you? N won't even try. I can't the say Mayor either. of South Bend, Indiana. Uh, uh, if for any one of these myriad presidential candidates, give us your 30 second, you're stuck in an elevator with Pete and you want to say, these are the three things I want you to do, uh, 30 seconds. It, this is simple. I just want them to understand the concept of social infrastructure and to see that in every infrastructure project that they want to build, if they think about the social capacity of the thing they're designing, they will build it differently. Okay. And the second, th that was great, that was 10 seconds. So you've bought yourself uh, 20, seconds, seconds. 20 seconds back. Still this in one debt like 30 minutes from all the other long-winded stuff. Is, this I one see. is even easier. You have been to, th whether for this book or the myriad other books you've written, you've been to some phenomenal places to do research around the world. Uh, what is the number one place you would recommend to all of us for our next vacation that is the paradigmatic kind of best place to go witness social infrastructure in action. So in other words, if Trump gets reelected, where should we all move to? <laughs> so uh, ordinarily what I say is something like the Netherlands, but they've kind of colonized IPK already through Rebuild by Design, and so I'm slightly nervous about saying the Netherlands right now. There's a part of me that wants to say Singapore, because Singapore has done so much to build this physical infrastructure, but it's not very democratic, Singapore. That's the thing, it's authoritarian. And so you get whatever the government decides to give, and sometimes they're very smart, sometimes they're not very smart, and that's not our model either. So I guess my answer is, if Trump wins, again, we need to all stay in New York and just supercharge the institutions that we built and not let them take it away. Because the reason that New York City is an amazing place, the reason that we're all here, the thing that gives us hope and inspiration and that makes us on good days, not the days when the trash is still on the ground and the subway is not working, but on the good days, the reason we like being here is because this is a city that got social infrastructure, that invested in social infrastructure, that, you know, that, that built a place where you can live a really good life, you know, re regardless of who you are and where you came from. And we, are, you know, we, we have failed to maintain that vision. But if Trump wins again, then we double down and make sure we do it. But you can spend the summer in Iceland, right? <laughs> okay, let's go to the hot pots in Iceland. Go to the hot pots in Iceland. All right, uh, where is the mic? Am I the roving mic? There's the roving mic, okay. I think there's some hands over here, so why don't we uh, go all the way to the back to our guest, and then since you're an insider, you get to go second. <laughs> You mentioned the university. One of the number one reasons people leave this university, the survey that my students have just completed, is because they feel alone. And it's also predicted that by the 2025, it's gonna be the number one killer, or number two killer, I'm sorry, of people in the world, including suicide. And NYU? NYU is one of the loneliest universities loneliness. according to students who leave. Loneliness, you're, uh, you're talking about loneliness. Is your, so your que is a question or just you know, what do I think about loneliness? The question is, we're building this university. We're yeah. building more of the university. We're putting up more buildings. Yeah. 
but they're still standalone buildings with no communication. In fact, if you look at the new buildings, they don't have social space. How do you fix it in your own university? Yeah, well, again, um, this is the, pl I mean, in my own university, this is the place that we've tried to build. You're sitting in the place that we've tried to build to solve this problem. And, you know, I'm not the president of the university or the provost or the dean of the university. I'm the director of the Institute for Public Knowledge. And what we spend most of our time trying to do is create gathering places and forums where people who are on campus can come together and engage with each other in different ways. And for people who aren't on campus, nine to five can come and have occasions like this. We really think hard about this and try to take whatever intelligence we have about it into the world as well. And we're, we think a lot about building gathering places. So I can tell you that I, sh I share your concern and I think this is a very hard thing about a, a campus like NYU, which is that it's, it's not really a campus in the classical sense. There's no, there's no green, there's no you know, sprawling area where you can play Frisbee. Uh, you know, or, or do whatever. There's not a lot of safe spaces. It's a tough urban environment. And I too worry about what, you know, what happens to students when they come here um, and don't have those central, those central areas. So, we, you know, we can try to create, it sounds like maybe you're a NYU faculty member, we can try to create connections in our classrooms. Um, we can try to volunteer in programs that help students connect with each other. We can try to create programming. Um, but I think one of the real challenges for NYU as an institution, I don't know if it'll ever overcome it, is that it's just, it's not a conventional campus that has a lot of publicly accessible spaces. I would like to see NYU think about this when it designs new buildings, um, you know, when it creates public areas, and hopefully they'll come and talk to us. Thanks, Eric. Um, you talked a lot about social infrastructure that seems to be very much linked to design, and so I have sort of three interlinked questions. No, three questions. S sorry, it's basically one. Okay. Um, first, um, how can we think about design not in an authoritarian way and think about how we can change, that's the second part, how we can change or have to change or maybe not have to change design pedagogy against the backdrop of social infrastructure? Do we need to change anything about how we teach designers of the you know, yeah. next generation? And thirdly, how can communities develop or design a way of making claims for maintenance, yeah, not so just now, but for the future. The maintenance thing is very political, and, and it, I think it involves sustained activism. It, c you, it can be, you know, you can try to get commitments to projects before they go up, right? But I think in order to get the maintenance done right, you need to have sustained activism. You can't let a government think that, you know, once they build it, they can walk away, um, because it, it, things will fall apart if you do it that way. As you probably know, the, you know, the thrust of Rebuild by Design was that we wanted to have a more participatory design process. And so a really interesting thing about this competition is that in the traditional design competition, what happens is that you announce uh, a prize for a winner of a design and then a bunch of people, design firms, like put in a proposal and then the nicest proposal wins. And then there's a lot of politics that happens. In the Rebuild by Design, we had a nine month process the teams came in with like a, a mission statement and a roster, and they got selected. There are 148 teams, 10 got selected for that. And then the 10 teams that were finalists had to go through a nine month process that involved three months of research, three months of outreach with all variety of stakeholders, and hundreds of stakeholders, you know, or organizationally came, came into the play around the region, and then three months of design. And I can't say that in the end, you know, some of the teams didn't just do what they were probably going to do anyway. I'm sure that inevitably that happened. But I can say for sure that most of the teams wound up designing projects that they hadn't thought about in areas that they had never been to before the competition started. And I do believe that they took very seriously what they learned from citizens and civic organizations and local political officials and small business owners and governors and, you know, congressional representatives as well. And I think it was a better process because of that. And to the extent that um, you know, design competitions and design processes can be inclusive, I think you get better ideas. Hi, my name is Samantha and I came from Philadelphia. So I love that you talked about Philadelphia. Um, I'm working on um, the West Philadelphia Promise Zone initiatives and I'm really interested in the work that you're doing. I did want to make just two quick comments and then ask a question. 
The first is about you know this idea about um, education being more acceptable and I, or accessible, and I think that's true. But one of the challenges that I face is that credentials are the thing that's actually needed for people to um, have some validity in the conversation. So while people may have accessibility to universities, um, I work in a community where Drexel University is very prominent, and they're doing a lot of work. My community members take part in things, but then there's a lack of opportunity for them because of the credentialing piece of it. Like, they can't afford to go to that school, frankly. Um, and so I, I would love to hear comments about how we solve that. And the second piece is around the technology. We talked about technology being a way that we can help to think about maybe maximizing you know, social infrastructure, maybe not in the Zuckerberg way, but um, as a component of libraries and that social infrastructure. But I, I know I'm working specifically on federal programs that are still even trying to connect people to the internet, so like broadband accessibility is still a challenge and the federal government's trying to fund that. And so for me, that's inherently a sort of middle class um, situation that a lot of my community members just don't, don't have that level of accessibility. And so I'm wondering about um, the ways in which we can think about technology and we can think about social infrastructure and where there can be smart investments for communities like mine where they're very um, predominantly low income, the poverty rate is 49% in the community that I represent. And therefore, the policy around this social infrastructure baseline for libraries is re relatively difficult. It's challenging. We can't fund those libraries. And then how we could fund the technology as a component of that to try to help make the, increase the accessibility and build those social, so build the social capital. I think those are great questions. Beth, you might want to say something on the technology access side because you know so much about this. Do you, do you want to? So, I, okay, let me start on the university side. Um, you, you talked about two things. You talked about credentials and you also talked about financial access. I think those are two separate things for you, right? There's, okay, so um, on the financial access, uh, again, I'm kind of like going to wade into my wife's territory and she knows a million times more about this than I do, so I don't want to say too much, but there are a bunch of states now, Tennessee is one that comes to mind, that are experimenting with state-funded initiatives that um, guarantee free tuition at community colleges and maybe some state colleges for at least a couple of years for everyone. And Tennessee did that in an interesting way. It's two years of community college, two years of community college as a, as a bridge. And what's interesting about that experiment in Tennessee is that Tennessee has like a re Republican governor and Republican administration. And maybe Michigan is doing something. So there are a couple of states that are like experimenting with these projects of saying, you know, education is no longer like a luxury. You now need to have access to higher education if you're going to be a real player in the labor market. And we're gonna use state resources to try to build back a system. And we've, we've gone through decades of retrenchment where states that, that once like built a middle class through collective investment in public education shifted to the private sector and made colleges and universities much less accessible. And they've done that um, with really negative consequences. And so it's interesting to see the pendulum swing back the other direction. So my wife's book's coming out in the fall. It's called Indebted. And we're gonna have an event on it here at NYU. So <laughs> she says much more, she has much more to say about this than I do. But on the, accessi on, on the accessibility, I think that's a, a huge issue. And you can expect it to be a bigger issue when in the presidential election. I think it's gonna be a thing that all of the Democratic candidates for office and my wife are talking about. Um, and on credentialing, um, you know, I think this is a really difficult thing. And, and that's about investing in um, public education more generally, right? If the main credential that people don't have is a high school degree, then the failures with our public school system, and that's also kind of done at the state and, and kind of municipal level. And it's another area where like, when we have massive tax cuts or when we say like, oh, the, that's about the market, you know, the market should solve that problem, we create real problems. And then I'm gonna let you do the tech thing because that's your world. I actually am going to say something really quickly on the first point, which relates to the tech point. Um, uh, so first of all, by the way, New Jersey has now announced, Sam will correct me, is it $30 billion in free community college grants now, making basically community college free for everybody. 
who wants a community college education, so in the state next door, which is a really great development. Um, but on credentialing in particular, and this relates to that, is that when it comes to, um, there's some really wonderful initiatives going on now around, number one, this gets back to the tech, is how do we make the data about credentials that people earn and what they're worth and what it means in terms of learning outcomes and workforce outcomes uh, transparent uh, and build the tools that allow people to know is this a credential that's worth getting, whether it's a public two-year or private two-year or four-year or a training program or something else. Um, so there are foundations like the Lumina Foundation and Schmidt Futures, which are putting a lot of money into the tech and infrastructure and data side of trying to make this question of credentials more transparent and more interoperable. Um, and there's a wonderful group called LRNG uh, Learning, um, spun out of the MacArthur Foundation, now has an affiliation with, uh, I want to say, New Southern New Hampshire College. Or maybe they're Southern New Hampshire, Northern New Hampshire, um, Southern New Hampshire. Um, but they're really focused on, particularly for kids, for young people in cities, the question of how do we use new technology to allow you to do different kinds of programs at a library, at another kind of social infrastructure place. So you go to an after school program, you go to a library, you go to the, this place, this maker space, et cetera. How do you actually take something away from that that you can roll up into a credential or a degree or something that you can show to someone else. So there's some really interesting ways, and I think this gets back to your broader point before, which is technology is a scaffold to enable other kinds of physical space interactions, whether it's these sort of learning interactions, whether they happen offline in a community center or they happen online. Technology is very useful in this case for just keeping track of the data, keeping track of that, keeping track of your 97 dates that you're gonna have, or in this case, the hopefully myriad um, programs that you're going to do. So I think the tech infrastructure is a much larger, broader conversation about investing in broadband and investing in uh, uh, technology infrastructure as much as physical infrastructure as a way to um, enable the kind of learning, the kind of human development, creative expression, and socialization that these tools uh, really make possible. But the policy conversation is, a, is, I think, a longer one for another time. It's going to get in the way of it's going to get me to talk more instead of you to talk more, so I'll leave it at that. One more. There's a, we have a, how many yeah. should we, should we like, pick a couple? You have a, we need a mic over there, all the way over there. Why don't we do a couple questions together yeah, and then we'll so break and make, make sure we have some time yeah, for them. Let's gather a couple. So I see or, Shannon also. Should I start? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, cool. So um, taking the conversation outside of the uh, urban metropolis um, and going into the suburbs, I'm um, from New York, but I go to school in Connecticut and uh, doing a project about public transit in Connecticut and looking at it as a social infrastructure. Um, and in Connecticut, a lot of the bus stops are literally on the sides of roads uh, and the systems itself are heavily stigmatized. So I was wondering throughout your research how you um, address stigmas of social infrastructures that either governments or you know private individuals or municipalities place on a lot of these institutions, and was wondering you know that research process. Thanks. There's a you can you can hand the mic behind you to yeah. and Kristen. Yeah. Go ahead. We're going to take a couple questions. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, wonderful conversation, and I confess I haven't read the book yet, but I'm looking forward to it even more now after this discussion. So. Um, Obviously, folks who are interested in urban design and urban sociology have been talking about the relationship between public space and sense of community for a long time. And so I'm very interested in your use of the word social infrastructure. And, and I'd like to hear you reflect, and I'm sure it's in the book, but if you could give us a preview about what you think framing this as infrastructure adds to that longstanding conversation, and are there any dangers in framing this as social infrastructure rather than the things we used to call it. Great, thanks. Uh, so my question is about interaction within these kind of uh, universally inclusive containers that you've described. Um, I'm wondering about, given what we know about the tendency toward homophily, whether microsegregation is an issue in these spaces and the extent to which um, programming uh, is necessary to overcome that. Okay, so let, I, I probably, my brain can't handle any more than three questions. <laughs> Okay, so um, I don't know, I, I mean, I didn't do a lot of research on the stigma part of it, I have to say. Um, so I can make stuff up. 
you know, or I could say like, send me your research when you're finished, and I'd be interested in learning what you come up with. I mean, I can say that part of the issue with libraries, and part of the reason I think people don't, um, a lot of people who are kind of like running elite philanthropies or businesses don't think of libraries as being um, lively, contemporary social infrastructures because libraries have become stigmatized in some communities as places for poor people. You know, you don't want to go study in library because it forces you to confront the problem of homelessness or the problem that we have like too, uh, we have inadequate treatment for people with mental illness. And so like that shows up in the library. And um, I think that affects the capacity of libraries to get funding from um, legislatures, from, you know, from, from city councils in some places. Not in all places, but um, it's notable that like Often, when, uh, some cities, when they want to rebuild the libraries or invest in libraries, they invest in like the equivalent of our 42nd Street, you know, New York Public Library, because that's an awesome, big, fancy building, and you want your name on that. But you don't necessarily want your name on the New Lots Library, you know, in East New York. And that's not true everywhere. Like in Columbus, Ohio, they passed a, um, a voter referendum. They voted to tax themselves more to invest in the municipal library system you know, regardless of who is using it, to make it a better place. But no doubt, you know, stigma can be an issue. And oh, well, I do treat another one in the book. The, the, the case of the American swimming pool is, an, is a horrible case in a social infrastructure gone wrong because, you know, sw swimming pools, and this will get to your point a little bit, you know, swimming pools were sites of racial segregation for m much of the 20th century until um, a real challenge. So, so originally, public swimming pools were not. They were segregated by gender. And when swim, municipal sw swimming pools were segregated by sex, they were ethnically and racially mixed without too much difficulty in most places. But when they got mixed by sex, they became more segregated by race. And when, after a series of lawsuits around the country, they were basically, municipalities were forced to integrate swimming pools many municipalities around the country just closed them down. And we saw a rise in private clubs and in private swimming pools instead. So, you know, again, there's a public social infrastructure that became stigmatized. And it speaks to your point a little bit, which is like, you can build places and hope that they will be sites of, you know, integration that will build bridges. But when it comes down to it, you know, you'll see some level of segregation by choice be because homophily is a thing. That said, I will tell you that if you walk around to the branch libraries in New York City, like pick, go to any neighborhood in New York City and go spend some time in the branch library. In fact, go to like suburbs around the country. The, I'm guessing, I haven't, stu I haven't seen the data, but I'm guessing that the libraries are among the most diverse and inclusive places in any place you will go. I mean, it's consistently my observation that if you go to affluent neighborhoods in poor neighborhoods in New York City, you will find surprising um, bridge building. And you'll find people sharing things in a relatively harmonious way. Not every day, I saw lots of fights over the bathrooms and you know who got to use the newspaper when, but in a pretty harmonious way. And then for infrastructure versus other concepts, um, I really want to emphasize the idea that like there's a thing called social capital. And so, so social scientists, you know, since James Coleman and really since Robert Putnam have been taken with the social capital idea. And what I'm saying in the book is that social infrastructure is what underlies social capital. Social infrastructure creates the conditions of possibility for social capital. It's not the same thing. And so the emphasis is on the physical place. It's on the production of the gathering place. It's like taking that Chicago idea and saying, some people might say the difference between this side of the room and that side of the room is that the social capital was weaker here and the social capital was stronger there. And I'm saying, yes, and it is stronger there, but most people think it's because of culture. It's not because of culture. Culture is actually a very weak explanation because what you find when you go from place to place is that groups that have the, a similar set of cultural traditions and orientations have really different rates of integration and connection. And what I'm arguing in the book is that it has to do with this set of the underlying substratum, which is by definition infrastructure. Okay, good. Two more questions or no? 
How about, how about well, let, let's do this, um, because I, there's a bunch of questions, and um, we also have wine and cheese and things like this. I'll stick around, and we can just talk informally. If that's okay can we do that? To, we would invite you please to come back on April 10th, also at 6 o'clock. We will have Professor David Lazer, Lazar, sorry, um, uh, who is a professor of both political science and computer science, again, blending two perspectives, talking about his new book, Politics with the People. Um, what's very interesting is that you've given us the argument here that we shouldn't let, in part, that we shouldn't let you new technology replace and do away with what are a perfectly good set of existing institutions that just need to be taken care of, like libraries. Uh, what he's talking about is putting in place some virtual institutions, namely virtual town halls, and the ability to use te new technology where nothing exists now, namely the right to participate in our own democracy in the lawmaking process with Congress. We have nothing to build on there. So we need to do something in technology, he argues, may be part of the way in some very simple tools and whatnot. But I invite you to join us on April 10th from 6 to 8. And otherwise, I just want to say thank you very, very much to Eric for being willing to talk about this wonderful new book and to you for coming. Thank you, everybody.